the tactical reason why United struggle to break down Newcastle's deep compact defensive shape, why Fred is a massive downgrade on Christian Eriksen, and how Eric Ten Hag could take inspiration from Xavi's Barcelona in regards to creating more down the flanks. But before I get into that, I have got a special announcement from the sponsors of today's video, One Football, which is now the place where on a Saturday night, if you're in the UK or Ireland, you can watch one free Italian Serie A game each weekend. As well as this, you can also use all the other football features that I've spoken about before with One Football. So if you are interested in watching European football, but just don't have anywhere to watch it, then you can go to the competition page linked in the description, and you can check out the free match that will be streamed this weekend. You can also watch highlights of all the Serie A games, and near live instant clips as well whilst the games are going on. And by downloading the One Football app, you will be helping to support the channel. So from United's build-up, we did see Newcastle engage them quite high up the pitch. In what was fundamentally a narrow 4-3-3, but Bruno Guimaraes would push up from the Newcastle midfielder line onto Casemiro, that deep single pivot in that Regista role, as Almiron and Murphy would sit high and narrow alongside Wilson. By utilising the front four in such a high and narrow shape, this allowed Newcastle to man-to-man -man press United in their build-up phase, with Callum Wilson, the striker, acting as a man to apply pressure to the player with the ball, whether this was the centre-backs, simultaneously looking to cut off the passing lane back across Scott goal, which was designed to force United over to one side, making their play a little more predictable. The two wide players, Almiron and Murphy, are narrow enough to give a raise to stop passes going between them, but wide enough to be able to move out to the fullback should they receive the ball. Whilst their high and narrow positions would also allow them to apply pressure to the centre-backs, if Newcastle looked to trigger press and Wilson was caught over the other side. Behind the front four, both Longstaff and Joe Linton would follow Bruno Fernandes and Fred when they pulled out into high and wider positions, giving Newcastle a full man-to-man -man pressing front six. However, while his narrow pressing shape did congest the central areas, it did leave space on the flanks. However, this was a sacrifice that Eddie Howe was prepared to allow, and it's pretty obvious why. The only avenue of beating Newcastle press via the flanks would be for David De Gea to clip a pass out to Shaw or Dalor. And whilst we did see David De Gea make this lofted pass on a number of occasions during the match, unlike keepers like Ramsdale, Edison or Allison, he does this far less often than United probably need. When the ball is clipped out to the flank, it needs to be pretty much perfect to allow the fullbacks to either knock the ball inside quickly or bring the ball under control. Control, with Joe Linton and Longstaff being the players to move out to the flanks to close down the space when the ball would go out to Shaw or Dallow, with the two fullbacks forced to remain deep, with Anthony and Sancho forcing them backwards with their high and wide positions. If David De Gea was a better long passer, then this would have forced the Newcastle wide players to maybe think twice about pushing so high up the pitch as this would obviously give the fullbacks more space, subsequently giving them more time to get the ball under control and find a forward pass to exploit Newcastle's high midfield line and attack through the space in the centre of the pitch. And this is why we saw United going long quite frequently from David De Gea to avoid getting into these pressing traps. When United were able to sustain possession in the middle third, we would see Newcastle drop into a 4-1-4-1, abandoning the higher narrow positions of the wide attackers, instead either dropping into a flat five behind Wilson or Joe Linton would remain slightly deeper, giving a 4-1-4-1 shape as Joe Linton would man-to-man -man press Fernandes, and so with Fernandes sitting between the lines, we often saw Joe Linton holding a deeper position out of possession than either Longstaff or Guimaraes. We did see Dalot hold that deeper position, creating a back three with Varane and Lissandro Martinez, giving United a wider and more secure base to circulate the ball around Callum Wilson. Fred and Casemiro would play more as a double pivot in the middle third, but with Newcastle's midfield line retaining deeper positions and being a lot more passive in the middle third than they were in the final third, we saw Lissandro Martinez, Diego Dalla and Varane have a lot more time on the ball than either Casemiro or Fred. And so United were using more of a 3-3-3-1 in possession, with Dalla sitting a lot deeper and narrower than Luke Shaw on the left, who did alternate his position in possession quite frequently throughout the match, sometimes retaining a narrower position in an inverted fullback role when Sancho was holding his width on the left, Left, but as United pushed into the Newcastle half, we would see him advance into a wide position down the left flank, which would enable Sancho to move into a narrower position, giving United more of a 3-2-4-1 in possession. However, despite United controlling possession, Newcastle defended exceptionally well, and United didn't really create anything of substance in the first half, as by half-time United had recorded an XG of just 0.18, with Newcastle recording 0.69. And this was caused by a number of different factors, the first was David De Gea's inability to clip those passes out to the fullbacks to allow United to bypass the press and then exploit the increased space in the centre of midfield. But even then, United need to be able to break down a deep defensive unit, even if they could play out of a high press. The majority of the time when you have the ball in the middle third, which you are going to have for the majority of your attacks, you are going to be tasked with breaking down a horizontally and vertically compact defensive shape. And the way to break through this is by moving the ball quickly from side to side, 
dragging that Newcastle shape across the pitch and hoping to create spaces between players. However, you also need players to play those incisive, penetrative passes into players between the lines, and United just didn't have this in this game, and this was largely because of the absence of Christian Eriksen. Now, I did do a video a few weeks ago analysing why Christian Eriksen is so important to Ten Hag's side, so I'll leave that linked in the description below and in the eye above for you to check out after this video, but I think this game was a great example of why Eriksen is so important to United's attacking approach, as Casemiro and particularly Fred just don't have that passing accuracy or vision from those deep positions to move the ball from in front of the Newcastle midfield line into players between the lines. But it's not just when Newcastle are behind the ball, it's also when the ball just falls to Eriksen in general, he just injects pace into the attack, whereas with Fred in that position alongside Casemiro, I just feel that United are too hesitant in midfield, taking a second longer than they need to shift the ball, and ultimately this slows up the whole attack, allowing Newcastle to get back into their 4-5-1 defensive shape, and perhaps that split second opportunity to take advantage of a Newcastle positional mistake within the system is gone, because United have taken too long to play that penetrative pass between the lines and Newcastle's players are able to adjust and close off that space. In my analysis of the Everton game last week I spoke about United using a thing called positional pinning and we did see elements of this in this game as well. If you aren't familiar with this phrase I've been using positional pinning, what it essentially means is positioning your players in possession in order to manipulate the individual positioning of opposition players, which should in theory create spaces in certain areas that you want to exploit. Here we see Varane is moving forward with the ball on the right side of Wilson, and because Eddie Howe was defending with a flat five behind the lone centre forward, Varane has his space to dribble into. This forces Jacob Murphy, who's playing temporarily as the left-sided central midfielder, into a decision whether he holds his position and allows Varane to move forward into the Newcastle half, or if he's going to look to halt Varane's movement forward by moving out of the Newcastle midfield line, which whilst allowing him to close down Varane will leave space in behind him. But in his image, we can also see that Anthony has effectively pinned both Dan Byrne and Joe Linton on the left side, holding a wide and higher position. Fernandes is able to recognise the situation and move across into the right sided half space, hoping that Jacob Murphy vacates that space and ideally what would happen is Murphy would move out to Varane and this leaves Dalot open because Joe Linton's been forced back by Anthony, Varane can just play the ball into Dalot and then Dalot effectively should be free and with Jacob Murphy dragged out of the midfield line and with players like Fred and Fernandes looking to pick up spaces between the lines, United would have a much better opportunity of feeding the ball into these players and working the ball through the centre of the pitch than they otherwise would if they didn't use this positional pinning to pull the Newcastle players out of their 4-5-1 shape. When Newcastle had the ball in their build-up, Eddie Howe's side had similar problems to United, and both sides used very similar, if not identical, pressing shapes. With Ten Hag continuing to use that narrow and high 4-2-3-1 that he's used throughout this season, with Bruno Fernandes pushing up onto Bruno Guimaraes who was playing as Newcastle's single pivot, Ronaldo the man who's leading the press and cutting off the passing lanes back across goal, with Anthony and Sancho like Al Moron and Murphy up the other end, retaining high and narrow positions, ready to press the centre-backs if the ball went into them. And so for Newcastle this gave them pretty much the same setup that United had, with the space being on the flanks and so if Pope could play those long passes over Anthony and Sancho, the Nike Ten Hag side this would be their best opportunity of playing out of their defensive third. And they did seem to go long a lot more often than United did, aiming for Joe Linton and Callum Wilson and looking to win the second ball in the middle third. However, when Newcastle did have the ball in the middle third, we didn't see United drop back into a passive 4-5-1 shape, as Newcastle did. Instead, we saw United continue to man-to-man -man press. Here we can see the midfield is still man-to-man -man pressing with Casemiro on Joe Linton, Fred on Longstaff and Fernandes on Guimaraes, which closes off Newcastle's passing options through the centre, but because United's wingers would hold narrow and higher positions alongside Fernandes, this congested the centre of the pitch further. As you can see here, Anthony and Fernandes are very close together, which stops Botman on this left side being able to thread a pass through both of them, being forced out to Dan Byrne on the left-sided touchline, which then allows United to squeeze across, looking to press over a smaller distance and potentially win the ball back. But United, like they have through most of this season, looked at their best when they transitioned the attack quickly. Sancho receives the ball in the middle third shortly after a turnover, and you can see that as the ball goes back, back here to Fernandes. Not only are the Newcastle midfield line caught high up the pitch, but also Kieran Trippier on this left side. And so Sancho spins round Trippier and makes that run into the left sided channel. And because it's Fernandes on the ball rather than say Casemiro or Fred, instead of looking for a safer sideways pass to circulate possession, he instead looks for that riskier killer pass to release Sancho down the left side. And this releases United into one of their best attacks of the game. Because United have countered so quickly, Newcastle can't get
get back into an organised defensive shape. And so there are obviously more spaces between players, and we can see a perfect example of this here as Sancho's moving down the left side. There's a massive space between the two centre backs, and because the midfield line of Newcastle was high up the pitch, Longstaff hasn't been able to track Anthony, and Anthony makes that underlapping run between the two centre backs. And this is where Sancho's at his best when he's coming inside on his right foot and he's able to thread those intricate passes to release on running attackers in behind the back line. And this leads to Anthony's shot from inside of the box, which is saved by Pope, but showcased how much easier it was for United to create chances when they moved the ball forward quickly rather than when they had to look to break down Newcastle's 11 men behind the ball. Now, United did finish the game with an XG of 1.42 to Newcastle's 0.79. However, up until the 80th minute, United have recorded an XG of just 0.36. And so apart from Marcus Rashford's headed chance at the end of the game which he had to score, United didn't really create any clear-cut chances. Although you can't really say that United didn't have the opportunity to create. Here is a perfect example, Fred's able to receive the ball in behind the Newcastle midfield line, and so drives the United attack forward. Here you can see Anthony on the right, and everyone in the stadium can see the opportunity of releasing Anthony as he's got the pace on Dan Byrne, and from this position you would want Anthony to make a slightly diagonal run, so that Fred rather than releasing him down the flank into a crossing position, he can instead release him into a more central position, potentially creating a goal scoring opportunity. And we've seen from his goals from that right side against Everton and Arsenal that if there's one player you want in a 1v1 from the right side, it is Anthony on his left foot. Anthony does exactly what he should do, makes this exact run, but Fred just takes too long with the pass. Once again, it's that hesitancy that just sees Fred hold on to the ball for a split second too long, and just like that, the opportunity's gone. Anthony has to check his run, and when Fred does eventually get the ball out to him on the right side, instead of him being in front of Dan Byrne, now Dan Byrne is in front of him, and whilst United are now in the final third in a very good position, they aren't in a goal scoring position which could have been the case had it been Bruno Fernandes or Christian Eriksen on the ball rather than Fred. But it wasn't just when they transitioned the attack quickly that United had opportunities to exploit Newcastle down the flanks. Here we see the boys on the right side and Newcastle are set up in their defensive shape, but United have plenty of opportunities to work the ball around the Newcastle players and get into a good chance creating position. First of all with Dalot and Varane keeping both Joe Linton and Dan Byrne occupied on the inside of Anthony. This allowed Anthony to isolate Jacob Murphy in a 1v1. However, since joining United, Anthony has been rather hesitant to take on players in these 1v1 situations, instead preferring to link with interplay or cut inside on his right and deliver an in-swinging cross. However, I think this hesitancy from both Anthony and Sancho when they have the ball in the flanks in these one-on-one -on -one situations can actually work to Ten Hag's advantage if he gets the right patterns of movement around those two players. With this example, as Anthony has the ball, the space is obviously in behind Dan Byrne and Jacob Murphy, and this opening is actually created by United's positional pinning. You can see Ronaldo in the box, rather than moving over to the right side to support the play, instead he holds his position. And what this does is it forces Botman to retain a central position, rather than being able to move across and close off that space. Because Dalot and Varane are sitting quite deep at this stage of play, both Dan Byrne and Joe Linton are pulled up the pitch, and so in order to get into that space, one of these two players has to make a run off the back of their marker and have a pass threaded down the flank for them either by Anthony or the other player on the right side. Especially against a side like Newcastle who are going to sit deep and compact and limit your opportunities to create through the centre of the pitch, the flanks become even more important than they usually are when you have possession and you're looking to open up the opposition. And I do think that Ten Hag can take inspiration from Xavi Hernandez's Barcelona. We see here in the El Clasico against Real Madrid that Barcelona are set up in that familiar 2-3-4-1 shape, which has become a familiar tactical shape in possession that a lot of the top sides use. We've seen Arsenal, Manchester City and Manchester United all use variations of this shape, setting up an either a 2-3-4-1 or a 2-3-5. Now a lot of sides that use this system like Manchester City, Arsenal and Barcelona are very fluid with their positioning with different players being able to pop up in different areas of the pitch, but usually whichever player is in which position, the overall shape most of the time should still be this 2-3-4-1. Here you can see Sergi Roberto and Pedri either side of Busquets make up the three in front of the two centre backs, with Usman Dembele moving into the left sided half space, and Alejandro Balde pushing up from left back to hold the width as Rafinha does it on the right, as Frankie de Jong sits in the right sided half space. So this is a familiar setup with someone maybe like Eriksen being in Pedri's position, Dalot being in Sergi Roberto's, Jadon Sancho in Usman Dembele's, Luke Shaw in Balde's on the left, Fernandes in place of Frankie de Jong and Anthony holding the width on the right side. As the play goes on you can see Sergi Roberto is pushing forward with the ball down the right side and the space is obviously between Mendy and Alaba, the space in behind so Barcelona want to be trying to get runners into that space and they created this space with positional pinning. You can see Rafinha's out wide which drags Furlong Mendy wider. Lewandowski plays a crucial role. You can see as the ball goes into Rafinha, 
that Lewandowski can see Sergio Roberto's third man run off of the back of Tony Cruz, and so rather than holding a higher position so that Alaba will stay in the defensive line, he instead makes a movement deep, dragging Alaba out of the defensive line and creating that space in behind both Cruz and Alaba. Rafinha finds the feet of Lewandowski, and from here, once he plays that first time ball, he takes both Alaba and Cruz out of the game, and simply by making that third man run ahead of play, Sergio Roberto has been released down Barcelona's right side in a dangerous crossing position. United could do this by switching the play quickly out to either Sancho or Anthony. For this example, it's Anthony on the right side, and have Ronaldo or whoever's a centre forward retaining a central position to pin both centre backs into the centre, exposing that space between full back and centre back, just as Lewandowski and Rafinha did in that example for Barcelona. And from this position, either Anthony could thread a pass down the line for Dalo, or you don't even need Anthony to be the player to thread this pass. He could play a ball inside, and Dalo could make a third man run off the back of his marker into that space, and United could effectively bounce the ball from Anthony on the flank to Fernandez on the inside, and down the line for Dalo, releasing him into a dangerous crossing position. But in this game, United didn't do this nearly enough. I thought the patterns of movement that United had down the flanks were completely off, with each individual player not working in tandem to release another down the flank. Here is a perfect example. The ball gets switched out to Sancho, who has massive amounts of space on the left, and you can see here behind him that Luke Shaw is galloping ready for the overlap. In this position, Sancho just has to engage the fullback, creating a 2v1 situation and then just sliding the ball down the line for Luke Shaw to then put in a cross. However, Sancho doesn't seem to be fully aware of Shaw's movement, and so instead cuts inside looking for a shot or a pass, but instead just puts a loose ball into the box, and the chance comes to nothing. I did think bringing on Rashford and taking off Ronaldo for the last 15-20 minutes was a mistake by Ten Hag, because if there is one player you want on the pitch, when it is getting late and you need a go, it is Ronaldo. Not only is his movement in the box phenomenal, but he also provides that aerial threat that you would think United would need, with Newcastle dropping deeper and deeper and getting more and more compact and leaving that space on the flanks. Rashford did have the best United chance of the game, but he did squander it late on, and you have to feel like it was a chance that Ronaldo would have taken. I personally would have kept Ronaldo on the pitch and either brought off Sancho or Anthony, and use Rashford as an inside forward from the left side where I do think he gets into better goal scoring positions. But even with Ronaldo on the pitch for the first 70 minutes, United didn't create much of substance at all, and it was Newcastle with Joe Linton's double header off the post, which probably has to go down as the best chance of the game, with Rashford having United's only real clear cut chance in the game.